Hey there, Sammy here with another episode of the Digital Marketing Therapy Podcast, ready to talk to you about keeping your organization and your nonprofit secure. Now, we all have different phases of our business from when we're just starting up and we're all volunteer based working in somebody's kitchen table to when we're ready to start hiring and developing a full board to when we're actually ready to bring in somebody that can act, handle all of our IT um, Across the board, there's always changes that are happening inside of our organizations. And with that, different opportunities to make our organizations more vulnerable. Vulnerable to people trying to steal our information or for people to take information from our organization to create their own. What I mean, whatever it could be, right? Copying, um, security, and then also just ensuring that our tech stack stays consistent and accurate and that we are not opening ourselves up to hackers and anything of that nature, especially if you're in a sensitive um, or regulated uh, industry or if you're serving a population that might need um, a little additional sensitivity. So I have brought on this episode one of my dear business friends, Emmy Baxter. She is a tech guru, and I um, am always asking her questions, and she's always supporting me in figuring out how to kind of clean things up, how to integrate everything, what the best software is that's out there. So we have a great conversation about different things to think about at three different stages that you might be in your business or as a nonprofit. Emmy is a longtime Bendite, committed to Central Oregon culture, breathtaking views, good beer, cider, wine, and spirits, oh my, and engaged people. She's known to others as a challenger, always asking questions, creating ripples in the status quo, and looking for a better way to thrive. In her business life, Emmy is a technologist with a twist, focusing on operational and technological insights and improvements aligned with businesses' visions and goals to maximize efficiency, increase, increase the profit, reduce the loss, and ultimately make technology work for you. She focuses on facilitating the acceptance of technology and empowering users to apply it to modern day business or everyday life. Above and beyond, her goal is to partner with users, bringing technology in as a resource to fuel your fire. And I love that so much because a lot of times technology is seen as a stressor and something that we have to figure out how to do. And her approach just makes people feel so calm and comfortable. Her passion is people. And she is quoted to say, I love technology, but I, but she believes in the people. I'm sorry. She is quoted to say, I love technology, but I believe in the people who use it because she knows that maintaining our humanity, our connectedness in time of automation and machine learning is more important than ever. And as technology continues to embed itself into our lives, it's up to us to give it roles and control the moments that we let technology live and do for us. In her free time, Emmy enjoys board games, hiking, reading, beta testing new software, and spending time with her tribe. I really think you guys are going to enjoy this episode. Um, lots of good resources tools for you here. Lots of good ways to take a look at where your organization is at and maybe some things you haven't been doing yet and things that you can implement with ease. But before we get into this, this episode is brought to you by my guide, nine ways for nonprofits to raise more money online. In this time of a global pandemic, and even though things are starting to open up, we still are finding that Fundraising is a challenging thing. So how can we get out there, get in front of new people, get in front of our current people and raise more money for our organizations to continue to provide the services that are making such a big impact on your communities? So nine ways to raise more money online. You can get this guide at thefirstclick.net forward slash fundraise. For now, let's get to it. You're listening to the Digital Marketing Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Sammy Bedell Mulhern, and each week I bring you tips from myself and other experts, as well as hot seats with small business owners and entrepreneurs to demystify digital marketing and get you on your way to generating more leads and growing your business. Hi, Emmy. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Sammy. So I've been wanting to have you on for a really, really long time. And I'm so thankful that we waited because now that I am kind of supporting nonprofits in a different way, I mean, that's something that you and I share a passion behind because you're on several nonprofit, well, I shouldn't say several, but you're on nonprofit board and you, you know, support several nonprofits in our community. And so I'm really excited that you're here to kind of focus on that with me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I definitely have a huge passion for the nonprofit world and, and, um, specifically how security and technology fits there because they bring 
um, you know, a unique service set generally to our more vulnerable populations or our areas of need. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's a lot to be mindful of about just from the top down approach, what nonprofits are thinking about fundraising, um, how to keep their services in line, and then, you know, rounding it out with technology and security. And most of the time, people are coming from a place of lack of knowledge. Yeah, right. Patchworking it Um, all together. Yep, exactly. And uh, we see it in other industries where uh, experts have come out where you might hire a marketing expert. I see nonprofits all the time are working, you know, with social media specifically, or like yourself, someone who's super knowledgeable at marketing content and strategy to get their vision across. And so that's happening in other areas. And it's pretty new to have it happen um, in that technology standpoint. Direct uh, Executive directors and boards are just expected to know what decisions to make. Mm-hmm. Well, and before we jump into, because, you know, we're going to break it down into the th- th- three kind of growth pain points that nonprofits go through. And I know that's oversimplified, but that's what we're doing. <laughs> um, why is it important for you just in general in your business as you're supporting clients to kind of take a holistic look at health as opposed to coming in and, and doing more traditional, I, what somebody would see as IT or tech support? Yeah, um, I really take that holistic approach because I think, um, and I see that technology is no longer a unique facet of our lives. It's um, fully integrated into everything we do, whether it's sending a message to our staff, uh, reaching out um, to get documentation signed, providing services during this time, being able to provide remote services um, to your client base. And so, it's no longer, you know, my business has a goal and technology is this tiny subset. It's that if you have a mission and vision for your business, um, technology has to be a part of that because if your vision is accessibility, um, you know, technology has to be accessible. That doesn't mean only running um, really graphics heavy websites that take a long time to load that maybe someone in a, a very slow internet environment wouldn't have access to. It means having um, you know, accessible website, something you run into, I think a mm-hmm. lot. Um, but it just means that it's no longer like the subset of our, our society. It's a part of our businesses everywhere, as well as our individual lives. So everything we practice in our businesses are actually things we take home and practice um, <clears throat> to keep ourselves safe and keep our kids secure and our friends. Because um, I really, I fall back on the idea that we're all linked, you know, um, <clears throat> by up to six degrees of separation, that that's how closely we know someone or could find someone that we know in any situation. And so if we look at that in a technology and, and data information perspective, it's really cool and really scary. Um, right. <laughs> because that means, you know, if I share something about maybe you, Sammy, let's say I shared in a different circle of friends, um, but someone there also knows you and it has a negative impact maybe you lose your job because of it in a time right now Mm -hmm. um where there's a lot of politically charged language and stuff like that even those pieces come into play to how are we protecting ourselves and those around us um and so i view it as this holistic perspective of our information and data belongs to us um the technologies that make it usable and shareable need to honor and protect that the same way that we would if we were dealing with, um, you know, physical things. Totally. It's, yeah, it's just a different way of managing all of your assets in your business. Yep. And one of the things that I love, and then we're going to jump into this, but one of the things that I love about you and that I think you and I are in alignment with is where we find most businesses go sideways is they like start going down the rabbit hole of like, okay, here's all the things that we need. Here's like, oh, look at this cool new shiny software. And, and instead of taking a look at what do I actually need? So going back to what you said, you know, what's my vision, what's my mission and how can I, um, get that across using technology? It's instead, what is, what are the things that I need to get done and how, what features, what things must happen? How can I automate in order to make things move smoother and then find the holistic approach to that as opposed to doing it the reverse, which I think is the way a lot of people do it. Absolutely. Um, You hit it on the head. And unfortunately, a lot of it's reactionary. Um, It's one of the most uh, struggle points for me is when I hear people making reactionary technology decisions because they tend to be painful and costly. Um, If we stay focused it just really aligns that if we stay focused on the mission and vision of a business, 
we can stay focused on what's important and prioritize it. And then it all becomes a part of the business workflow and a part of standard business operations instead of a technology add-on um, or something that's in the way of, you know, incredible employees and staff and volunteers meeting needs. Um, those are things that tend to be controvert or not controversial, um, adversarial or conflict oriented mm-hmm. between um, leadership, executive staff, those kinds of things, and um, program staff or implementation staff. And that that doesn't have to be the case. I really view it as an opportunity to say, let us elevate you, let this technology elevate you to do the absolute best parts of your job and let go of the majority of the worst parts. That's awesome. And I, I, yes, I agree with all of that. (laughs) Okay. So let's start into what kind of I see as phase one. You've got an idea, you've decided to start a nonprofit and your, or even a business. I mean, this could relate to any startup business, right? And you have now maybe a handful of people that are helping you or you have, you've kind of pulled together this volunteer board, but everybody's basically working for free. And so you've got, you know, passwords for things that are being shared all over the place. You've got, you know, you're probably not all necessarily in a secure network. You know, everybody's working from their own personal computers. Like what are the biggest red flags that people might want to look at first in order to keep all of that information that you're kind of pulling together at the beginning safe? Absolutely. I think really from my perspective, the most important thing to look at is um, defining access and privilege levels. So even when you're at a couple of people what do they need to know or what, you know, what access, what data do we have access to? What do we need to know and who needs to know it? Um, because in these times you're generally dealing with one or two people who have copies on their physical computers um, or devices, maybe even hard copies. And then are we sharing it from there? I'm not necessarily the person who's going to say, you know, instantly create a, a shared cloud drive. Um, and and get everyone involved. I think it's really important to start with with the who's and what's. Not every nonprofit is dealing with data they have to be so worried about from a from a um like a privacy, like it, it would be different yeah, to dealing with kids and or, regulatory yeah. standpoint, um, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but it's more just we want to keep ourselves secure and safe. And so that's really becomes business best practices. And unfortunately most of those are um policy based or what I might call an administrative control. So those are things you train into people, not necessarily uh, hard technologies that you implement. Um, but I would I would start with who needs to know what what access is that and then how could we implement it based on what we have. I'm I am a big fan of you know Google Drive mm-hmm. or uh, Office 365. I'm not necessarily going to pick one over another. All of the cloud services are pretty comparable, and it's dependent upon um, kind of your needs. But I would set one of those up and have you know the executive director, even if it, uh, it's at a volunteer level, that person and the board, because the board generally has ac- uh, has the right to have access to that, um, where you're sharing that information, and then um, kind of drill down from there as you get people who work who are working in and out. This is a time where you have to be really super dynamic and it's hard to have structure, but if you can lay the foundation, it will make it a lot easier to transition to, um, you know, those phases two and three of a nonprofit where you're, you're getting into bigger budgets, more staff, uh, potentially paid staff, those kinds of things. Well, and what I love, I mean, I'm just going to talk about Google because I don't use Microsoft 365 personally, so I don't know it as well, but I mean, I'm sure it has all the same features. But what I think is great about the the Google platform is that, you know, then you're not having to pay for additional software for things like Word, Excel, what have you. Yep. Um, but it also really easily allows you to maintain permissions and remove people. So if somebody then does become not involved in the organization. It's not a matter of, okay, I need you to give me all of the files back. It's you just remove their access and moving forward, they don't see it anymore. Yep, absolutely. I am a big fan of those aspects. Um, I prefer shared drives or recommend shared drives over people keeping copies on their computers um, and love that about pushing people to use web applications. So I, I believe there are even versions of Office 365 now where you can only use the web application as opposed to the Um, downloaded software on your computer because that really helps protect businesses in those points. Not that people may be malicious, but they might be careless um, Mm -hmm. or unintentional. And so it gives that protection. You know, Google, I I do personally use Google more extensively. um, 
And so it has fantastic features where you can turn off people from saving passwords. You know, you can transfer all the documents from one user to another if there are concerns. You can remove permissions. Um, you can create different organizational unit levels within Google. So it's pretty easy at the at the top level to say, hey, these people deserve or get access to everything. Not deserve. They simply <laughs> uh, have a job role that requires access right. to everything. Um, versus these people really only need access to this. and setting really clear boundary lines um, on making it so that people don't even see what they don't need to see. Yeah. And at, so at this, I mean, if you're pretty much just starting up an organization, it's probably mostly like password sharing and document sharing. That is the biggest security risk. I think the other thing that I come across a lot um, is obviously a website is something that, well, I say obviously, because that's my world, but you, you know, I recommend having a website, even if it's just a simple landing page when you first get started. And so then that opens up the whole question of hosting and domain purchasing. Um, I've seen a lot of organizations that get stuck because somebody leaves or a volunteer does it and then you don't get the right access. So do you have recommendations on where all of that information should be held? Absolutely. Um, I, and that's happened so many times, native or tribal knowledge is kind of the detriment to technology and, and organizational stability. Um, I am a big fan of password managers. I will say I hate password protected spreadsheets. Please don't put your passwords in spreadsheets. <laughs> Just don't do it. It's, it's terrible. I don't care how big your password is to protect it. It's not a good practice. It requires that people be responsible for updating it and sets just so many opportunities for error um, and for someone to gain access to that information and uh, use it maliciously against your organization. We're in a time frame where that um, can create irreparable damage. You know, reputation is everything mm -hmm. in in a world of services that you're that are, you know, that are targeting vulnerable populations and whatnot. So I'm a big fan of I've used LastPass, I've used 1Password, I've used Dashlane, I have used Keeper, I have used Password Manager. Um, those, it comes down to ease of use. I'm a big fan of, you know, when you're this size, I hate saying sharing credentials is a good idea, but it can be hard or cost ineffective to... Um, you know, have three or four or five user accounts for things like that. But even being willing to get a free or paid ver uh, password manager to store everything um, is kind of that make or break difference from being able to transition info over, you know, knowing your wireless password um, to the network. I just worked with a nonprofit that I had to completely reset up their entire wireless network because they had no information around it, um, no credentials. And the way it was set up was that without those credentials, the only option was to reset it completely. Mm. So it's a duplicate of efforts, which unfortunately they then had to pay for, right? Right. Um, and that's, that's the stuff that it's just so painful on, on the end of it to have to be in that situation that if you can take the time to have a password manager set up with a couple of the folders of like, Hey, shared it passwords. That's one of my favorite folders where it's, <laughs> you should be your website should be your hosting, um, should be things like that, that are important that you might not access a lot. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of what else should be in there, but really I think password managers are super critical and important. They should be one of the first things that, that people are willing to invest in, um, not just from the security perspective of where it's maintained, but it also simplifies uh, management and password usage. I'm going to push people to use 10 or 12 digit passwords. I, ideally, in my world, I'm saying 16. Every time you add a couple of digits, you add potentially hundreds of years to the amount of time it would take a, a supercomputer or a hacker to um, crack that password. When we get but, down yeah. into eight and 10 characters, we're talking about 90 days. Wow. Um, and so having a password manager that will also generate automated passwords for you, you can tell it, you know, hey, I want it to be easy to read, or I want it to only use um, uppercase, lower and lowercase numbers, or excuse me, letters, you can kind of create rules around that and then just have it generate and it will automatically save for you. So it takes a lot of that thinking out of it. It takes, um, whether we like to acknowledge it or not, the pattern making that we naturally do out of it so that we can remember it um, yeah. and really creates that level of extra security. Because I think that the hardest thing about 
individual created passwords is that if someone knows you, um, it's pretty easy to make some jumps about what your password may be. If I know someone and I know they're really into flowers, I'm going to start with their favorite flower in the current year. Um, almost any favorite thing or child's name or pet's name in current year, I see it all the time. So it's like there's super easy ways that people don't, they think they're being unique and it's very common. Well, and that then makes that password manager all the more important because then you can create those complicated ones and don't even have to think about it anymore. Yep, exactly. It's just a push of a button. You say generate, fill, it enters it for you and save and you hit save, adds it in and you're, um, you know, you're all updated with pretty minimal thought on your side. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to just, uh, well, last two things I'm going to touch on on the website thing and then we're going to move on. But um and, and not just for websites, but any platform that you have that allows you to create multiple users, that's always better than just like saying, like for a WordPress login, like you wouldn't want to just create admin with a password and then share that with everybody, right? Like take advantage of the fact that they can create multiple users yep. because then saying you can remove people. Yep, that exactly. You need to. So um, ideally, whenever it is not absolutely cost prohibitive, I only put that caveat, caveat in there is just because some companies will just kill you for per user licenses. Mm -hmm. um, but as long as it's not cost prohibitive, you always want to have a standard practice of making each individual their own account. Um, that's best practice for everyone. It provides great logging and allows you to remove them as an individual, like you said, if they depart or anything like that, as opposed to having to inconvenience everyone to update the password or unfortunately run the risk of being that organization that chooses not to and just hopes that person that left, um, you know, has the best intentions at heart, which unfortunately sometimes they don't. I've definitely been involved in instances where we had to um, do pretty extensive log reviews and data analysis to determine that there were malicious actors who had access to shared passwords that hadn't been updated um, who'd taken actions. Well, especially in a startup where all parties go in assuming something's going in one direction. And if things start to change and maneuver in a different way, because I mean, that as businesses grow, like, you know, things evolve sometimes feelings get hurt and people that you wouldn't think would be malicious, like you said, maybe because they got, you know, emo ego and all that stuff comes to play. Yep. Emotion. I think the instantaneousness of digital technology sometimes allows us to, to react mm -hmm. to those intense emotions in ways that maybe we wouldn't expect people to do so. And so creating barriers that remind people of space or simply don't give them that privilege um, benefit both parties. I kind of yeah. try to relate it to the idea that clear is kind, unclear is unkind. So technology is a form of protective barrier for both parties involved. Those that, well, really all parties. So those that are served, um, employees and staff, and also donors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. And I just want to be clear about one thing. If, um, speaking on this, when you purchase your website domain, and I think you'll agree with this, make sure that the organization purchases that domain wherever possible. So that again, you don't run into a situation where there's a lapse and somebody doesn't renew it. And then you lose a lot of, yep. I mean, it takes you so much longer to fix all of that. Yep. Completely agree with you wherever possible. Those things that I would call proprietary, which mostly is your domain, those kinds of things you mm -hmm. want to have under the organization um, and record clearly yeah. documented or recorded so that it can carry, carry on. Okay. So let's say you've moved past the startup phase. You've gotten your funding. You're ready to hire staff and really make a bigger impact. Um, I think a lot of the things that you said in the startup phase are going to remain true as far as like the password protection and permissions, users, right? You're just going to have more of them. Yep. Um, as people start to add, and this isn't necessarily a security question, but as people start to add on to their tech stack, so maybe they're now hire, hire, or hiring, adding a donor CRM. Um, maybe they're adding like QuickBooks or um, financial software. Um, what kinds of things as far as integration go, or I guess like, you know, just inter integration and how things connect should be a big part of that conversation when adding your tech stack, right? Yep, absolutely. I mean, um, we live in a really cool cloud-based world today. Uh, there's still a lot of what I call hybrid environments that have 
physical hardware on site or a lot of physical components um, that are individually invested in and owned in collaboration with cloud environments that meet the need. But really for, for most smaller businesses, startup and second say, kind of second phase growth businesses, um, primarily cloud-based environments are going to be the ideal situations because um, it's, the, it's the forward way of technology. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to invest in robust hardware that would support these types of integrations, right? It was, we're talking about QuickBooks, potentially a donor CRM, um, pre-existing email and things like that. If, if an organization is handling that all, um, on the server side and physicality side, yeah. it becomes almost impossible. So, so what, I would you, what would you say though to people that are like, well, the cloud doesn't like, if it's in the cloud, I'm going to lose it more likely, or it's not as secure. Like how, how, how do you explain that to people about like your internal server versus the cloud and that they are mm-hmm. just as safe, if not safer, probably in the cloud than in their own internal server? Well, and that's actually one of the things I kind of talk to people about is I ask them questions about when they've ever touched their internal server, when they've done updates to it, or what types of security they have on it. And most people don't know. They, um, there's kind of this, this natural impression of security because it's physically in our presence, um, mm-hmm. even though realistically the risks are actually higher. You know, most businesses aren't necessarily alarmed in a way, or especially nonprofits that are alarmed in a way that if I broke in and stole their server, um, that I might even be caught. So it's, it's kind of this balancing act of we know and tr- we trust what we know and what we're capable of. And then realizing and kind of talking about the fact that cloud infrastructures are built by the most advanced, knowledgeable individuals in the security industry today, mm-hmm. worldwide. That's not just in our nation, that's in our, in our entire globe with intention and goals specifically around security. And they practice the same approach as I'm talking about, access of least privilege. You know, a person who works on AWS um, or Azure, Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud Services, they don't see access to that data. They don't necessarily get into anything. They see um, beneath your data, behind it, below it, around it, uh, everywhere but within it. And so it's almost like, to me, it's more like... Um, hiring a specialist yeah. to do the work and putting trust in that than viewing that as a lessening of security. Well, and they're, I mean, they have professional hackers on their team that are constantly trying to break into their own oh, yeah. software. And there's, there's a huge population of, of uh, white, hat, hat, white hat hackers, which are ethical <laughs> hackers, both volunteer and paid, that attack the most common, like Google, Apple, Microsoft, all employ them. There are huge conferences around, again, the globe, um, where these attacks are practiced, are put it, given feedback to these organizations, and they patch them pretty quickly. They're mm-hmm. able to put out patches and invest resources on, on, um, into mitigating risk at levels that no individual business can and definitely not a nonprofit can. Right. Well, and from a cost perspective, you know, cloud-based applications are generally less expensive as well than than this internal software that you would need in the data systems in order to keep it local. Yep. So, it tends to be cost-effective. It tends to also enable especially as we talk about, you know, the last 3 months with um, a pandemic specifically, mm-hmm. but other instances, the idea of enabling remote work. I had the pleasure of last year, I worked with a nonprofit where we did all of the work last year just for them to be able to work remotely, even though they didn't have any need. Um, and because of that, when COVID hit, they did not have a single day that they were closed and not providing services to their, to their client base. That's incredible. Um, and that part of that is cloud-based services. And that, when you are a mission-based organization, that becomes really critical. And I think it's powerful in a way that that is cost-effective. It can be scary and, and feel scary, but I think it it really is about forward thinking or re reevaluating back to that vision and going, what is our core goal? Our core goal is to provide services. Mm-hmm. What are the ways we can make that happen? Um, I worked for a company previously and we ran like all of our stuff uh, on SAP and it was not cloud-based. And so we had like the, I don't even know what it was, like some local host thing that we had to log into in order to get access 
to the back end mm-hmm. if we were at home and it was painfully slow and really hard to maneuver through. So I'm with you there. Cloud-based all the way just makes it so much easier um, yep. for all parties involved. And integrations are usually a lot easier as well. Yep. I mean, we live in in the software world. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of software options. And so the developers who plan integrations do unfortunately have to plan them and cater to those that rise to the top. So that is part of it that what you see kind of succeed and out there is because there was a significant um, investment into making it usable um, and accessible to a greater population group. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Anything else that I'm missing to ask about kind of that middle area of, um, you know, like we're starting to hire staff, we have a team, we might have an office. Um, I think the only the other thing that I really like to see happen in this middle area is going to be a, an add on, you know, in step one, I talked a little bit about defining that access and privilege level um, in in that second phase of growing, adding some staff on it, it would be starting to define your IT policies, um, not that it's super rigid or that they have to be finalized, but they should start to be documented and you should start to say things like, Email is used only for work purposes. You mm-hmm. use your organization-based email when you communicate with clients because this is where we get into the phase that we we would start to get more up against those regulatory compliance components um, and starting to, to really need to evaluate um, not just how are we acting today, but what, what happens with this stuff. And how are we protecting the data of our donors? How are we protecting the yep. data of the, those that we serve? Yep. Retention policies. Again, I call them uh, uh, administrative controls versus technical controls. This old, this twofold multi-layer dynamic of that we have to train um, and define what's okay so that people know and then provide, put in technology to support that. Okay. That's a very good point. Um, And so kind of the last phase, and this isn't the last phase because obviously we're always growing, but kind of the next step up I see is okay, so now we've been trucking along for a few years, our budgets are increasing, and it's time for us to bring somebody internal to help us manage. Because as you add more and more and more to your tech stack, as you add more services, as you're reaching a larger audience, um, it becomes at a certain point, it becomes beneficial to have somebody in an IT role in-house or at least on a regular contracted retainer. Mm-hmm. And so what kinds of things, as you start to put that together for your organization, what kinds of things might you want to think about in that person, in that role? Um, what, what kind of questions might you want to ask, you know, to find that right fit? That's a really good question. Um, finding the right technology fit is super challenging and super important for a couple of reasons. One of them, of course, being the technology itself and the reliability of that access for your organization, but twofold because technology isn't just implementation and it's a lot of training, um, coaching and interacting, problem solving, troubleshooting, those things. It has to be a person who can also align with your mission and vision um, Mm -hmm. or an organization that can align with your mission and vision because if they don't see value in it, it will be really hard to have a um, comfortable relationship of support. So some of the things that I think about, I really try to recommend that organizations start with an internal form of risk assessment. So talking with your board and saying, what are the areas we're concerned about? Um, Most executive directors should have um, access to resources where they know what regulatory compliance issues they have. So if you're dealing with people, HIPAA, um, PII, so HIPAA is health protected data, PII is personally identifiable information, Um, FERPA, which is like school Mm -hmm. information. Hopefully you're using a good donor CRM and payment processor where you're not dealing with the payment card industry or the PCI data. But this is where you have to start saying, okay, what regulatory compliance issues do we have? And not that we're going to take them all into account, but we have to be aware um, of what kind of legally our expectations are. And then you take that and compare that to your business and say, what does that mean in comparison to our services? And much like a financial audit, there are going to be things that you say, 
ideally we would do this, but it's so cost prohibitive or the risk is so low that we're simply willing to absorb it. So you just look at your organization and say, you know, what are our risks from a technology standpoint? Could we survive this? Um, and you, I recommend a tabletop situation of what would we do if our building burned down? How quickly would we be a backup for services? What types of hardware would we have to replace? What, I mean, that's on the technology side. It can help the organization generally as well, just to know what, um, program supplies they would need to replace or X, Y, Z. And to take that approach, then take that and say, what are the top priorities we have? Pick those because it's not going to be everything. And to fit those in ideally into your strategic plan or whatever type of plan you work with your board on and to then try to find a person that or um, organization, a consultant organization that aligns with that and can help bring that to life. It's really a multi-year, um, tends to be a multi-year process and commitment. So finding that good relationship and under, having them understand that it's a longer term vision sets both organizations up for success. And so, so I guess the other piece is, so then yes, from the secure or from the being, being able to fix things perspective, um, that's one piece. And then the other piece to me is, is it important to, for them to really understand all of the tech, the, the tech pieces that you use so they can also help you with the customization. So like, let's say you've been using your donor CRM for a while and it's been working well for you, but now you're ready to really kind of go in and take it like take the extra features that maybe nobody else on the team is able to implement or do some additional customization. Like, you know, is that the same person or is that almost like a different set of skills? Um, that's a really, Ooh, that's a tough one because it can <laughs> be, I don't have a single answer for that. A lot of the time it's not necessarily the same person. Um, especially if you go with an organization that commits to a specific software set or approach, if that makes sense. It's, mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with having a specific line that you support, but being um, completely agnostic tends to make you um, hyper comfortable and hyper familiar with working in interfaces, even if you've never worked in it before. So I would say that, um, you know, an organization that comes in and says, we really want to implement Office 365 and these and this and this are probably going to be really great from a support perspective, but maybe not the right fit to say, um, you know, we work within our donor CRM and it currently doesn't do any of our automated emailing. We like manually email. That wouldn't necessarily, and that's not the hardest thing, but that wouldn't necessarily sometimes be the right organization. And that's where that can be a struggle fit where um, if you have someone that's more focused on strategy um, or you find an ind individual that's a little bit more focused on strategy and that back to that holistic um, picture and approach, they can be a little bit more effective in helping guide you in how you might maximize your usage of an existing tool. And a lot of times that, that comes from my perspective in there's a little bit of difference between um, a managed services provider, uh, which is what I would call someone who has a contract like that and provides support generally, and um, like a technology consultant in the sense that a technology consultant is generally going to come in and ask you a bunch of questions to try and figure out what you don't know that you don't know, what your organization isn't doing. So like I might ask a nonprofit, how do you send emails? How many times a month do you touch your donors? Um, what ways does that happen? Is it manual? Is it verbal? You know, do you send text messages? Things that other people... Uh, that an MSP, a managed service provider, wouldn't get into or necessarily think about. Um, but that creates that opportunity to say, oh, you guys aren't doing that and you use this donor CM CRM, you could implement these three things and potentially increase your reach by 500 people. So um, maybe what I'm hearing then is, you know, when you step back, when you're in the phase of maybe just starting to hire people and starting to build your tech stack, that's a great time to have somebody come in and as a tech consultant and help you build that so that you do start with the right tech. And then as you get into the phase where you're really wanting to bring an IT type person in house, putting those, all of those needs in place so that you can hire the right person to support what your biggest areas of risk and or need are will vary between departments, but if you know, or between um, organizations, but if you already know that your tech stack is for the most part solid, um, I think a lot of times, especially with 
you know, people in their mid twenties to, I don't know, I'm going to, this is a gross generalization, but like a lot of those software programs have training programs as well. And you could potentially just train the employee that is going to be diving deeper into that and keep your IT as really like, let me help make sure everything is secure. Nothing's breaking. We're following like the technology best practices and, and, and making sure that our business is secure. Yep. Yep. You hit it on the head. Um, okay. I, I think a lot of awesome software providers now are assuming or at least pushing for the idea that it's really expensive and difficult to have specialists in every software set. Like you said, you mentioned SAP. It's one of the hardest oh software sets. Like people are paid specifically because they have a skill set and knowledge base there. It's that's hard to maintain in the world we live in today. So there's a ton of value in making something that can be set up and implemented. And that might be something where you need a specialist, but then can be transitioned um, to the staff or to that team to really work with on, on the daily or the regular, because I know you would say specifically with websites, Sammy, those should be living. They should get updated mm-hmm. regularly. So it's mm-hmm. not super awesome. You know, if, Um, I only touch their account once every six months or something like that, as opposed to maybe training them, hey, you can update this section here by adding new text. And once a month, maybe they add a blurb because you you set it up in that way. Um, Social media, I just think there's a lot of examples like that where it doesn't once it's set up, um, there's a lot of ability to interact with it and make minor modifications and changes to still maximize impact and maxim- maximize effectiveness of those tools um, without having to, to pay an extra specialist or pull someone completely outside from the outside into the organization. Well, and I love the, that you mentioned, you know, the tech consultant, you know, or even it could be a marketing consultant and a tech consultant combined that would come in and, and ask the questions like, how often are you emailing is it, you know, like all of that whole series of questions that you brought up is so important to long-term growth of a business, but also to the technology that you're using and the priority. Like if you're only emailing once every six months and you have a list of 10 people, like don't pay for email marketing software. And then you don't have to worry about that integration. Right. Yep. Um, exactly. but I do think you don't know what you don't know. Um, and that's why this conversation, and, and we've only scratched the surface, right? But that's why this conversation, I think, is so important for people to think about because I do think the IT piece is sort of an afterthought until it's blown up in your face and all of a sudden you're scrambling. Yep. When emergencies cost money, I, I don't care what type of an emergency, definitely technology related, but right if a house burns down, it's really expensive. Um, so I, I really kind of stress the idea that if we could shift to preemptively thinking about it, it would actually cost us less um, to implement technology, align it with our mission, and really see a huge return on our investment in it. Um, it's something that I believe can can quell finance finance people who, you know, are always focused on that that pocketbook in the bank account mm-hmm. and what does that say? It can support executive directors that are wearing eight hats. It helps fundraising. Um, and like I said, Right now, technology is making it so that staff or program staff can connect with whatever their clients may be and provide services. So to me, it, it is that you can't really have your mission without it anymore. Right. Uh, and so it's a matter of do you willingly, in, do you create intention around how you're going to implement it and how you're going to use it to elevate your organization? Or are you going to be controlled by, by those reactions? Right. And I think that's, I mean, a great way to sum it up and, and end, um, end this episode. There's so many good things that you dropped in great tools. And I will make sure that we include all of those in the show notes for this episode. Um, Emmy, thank you so much for joining me on this episode. And if people want to learn more about Avant Tech, which is your amazing tech business, how can they, how can they find you? Um, they can email me. M E E M I at the avant tech.com. But uh, my website should also be up, uh, which is uh, the avant tech.com. Yep. And we'll put all those links in the show notes as well. I appreciate you coming on and sharing all of this with everybody. Thanks so much, Sammy. I really appreciate the opportunity and um, I'm really excited to just get, get to share a little bit about this. I think you and I have a lot of overlap because you're in, in that marketing and technology space. Um, and I view just the collaborative interactions between technology and all of the other entities that make up a business or a nonprofit 
to be really cool. It's really exciting and fun to see these types of interactions come together and see organizations elevated um, because they get more for their for the value than um, historically. So much more for the value and way less stress once it's all done. Yep. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emmy. <laughs> Thanks, Sammy. I am so thankful that Emmy joined me on this episode. It was so much fun to do. Um, she and I live in the same area. We are working and collaborating on our businesses together all the time. And so I'm very thankful to have had her come on and share all of the knowledge bombs that she shares with me all the time with you. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on a single episode. Check out the show notes at thefirstclick.net forward slash podcast. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.